and welcome to World Inside, coming to you live from Beijing News. I'm your host, Tian Wen. Coming up on today's program, a seven-year British inquiry into the Iraq war has concluded that the conflict was mounted on flawed intelligence and executed with inadequate planning. So who is to blame? Then RIMPAC 2016, a Chinese naval fleet has arrived in Hawaii for U.S. organized military drills. What is the significance of China's participation amid heightened U.S.-China tensions? And we sit down with Stephen Talman, a professor of Oceanic Law, for an in-depth discussion on the legality of the South China Sea territorial disputes ahead of the Hague ruling. Britain has published its long-awaited inquiry into the Iraq war. The Chilcot report concluded that the country went to war in Iraq before all peaceful options had been exhausted. Let's take a look at the details. The inquiry was launched in 2009, aimed at establishing clarity around Britain's involvement in the war, from decisions made to actions taken. Former Prime Minister Tony Blair has been accused of misleading the country into war. Last year, he apologized for mistakes both in decision-making and intelligence. Sir John Chocot, who led the inquiry, said Britain's plans for managing the Iraqi occupation following the 2003 invasion were wholly inadequate. There was a sense in which after Bosnia and Kosovo and Sierra Leone and the rapid overthrow of the Taliban, we and the Americans thought intervention was relatively easy. It wasn't without its costs, but it was something we could achieve relatively quickly and provide a very positive humanitarian outcome for the people involved on the ground, whether it's in Kosovo or Sierra Leone or wherever. And that was the expectation in Iraq. And of course, entirely the opposite was the case. The Iraq war was launched by then U.S. President George W. Bush in 2003. In addition to causing the deaths of almost 180 British troops and some 4,500 American personnel, the war also triggered violence that killed hundreds of thousands. And it is true that much of the intelligence turned out to be wrong. As president, I'm responsible for the decision to go into Iraq. In a CNN interview last year, Blair acknowledged his missteps. That I apologize for the fact that the intelligence we received was, was wrong. I can also apologize, by the way, for some of the mistakes in planning and certainly our mistake in, in, in our understanding of what would happen once you remove the regime. The report is particularly damning in light of the undeniably negative impact the Iraq war has had on the region. Its destabilizing effects are still rocking the Middle East today. And for more on the UK's Iraq war investigative report, we are joined in the studio by Mr. Zhu Chenghu, who is a Chinese military expert, retired from the PLA National Defense University. Uh, General Zhu, uh, help us to understand this. Of course, in the report, there's no smoking gun. In other words, nothing really shocked us. But when you look at it in retrospect, what do you make of the UK's build up to the war in Iraq together with the United States? I think I'm very glad that uh, people in UK is now rethinking of the war. And I believe that the why the UK is involved, was involved with this war is that uh, UK is, was not independent enough. It followed the United States. And actually, if you look, I, I do hope that uh, the Westerners will rethink about their policies. And different wars, like the war in Iraq, like the war against Libya, and other wars. So these sort of wars have brought so many uh, killing and uh, disasters to the people in the locality. And I hope that uh, the United States and the other Western powers should not use their military power to talk to the regimes in other countries. You right. should respect the choice of the people of different countries. This uh, General, is very because important. you are coming from the military, so may I also put forward a question related to that. Uh, one of the things being mentioned by the Chilton report is the so-called can-do spirit of the British military before it goes to the war with the United States in Iraq. And of course, when you look at it now, uh, it was not necessarily should be a spirit that 
can be encouraged. And people wonder whether it's just in the UK or elsewhere as well when it comes to what the military's role should be and how much the role military should play in the national policy decision. I believe that uh, the military should uh, support the foreign policies of uh, different countries, but these policies should be constructive instead of uh, disruptive. So this is very important. I hope that the militaries of Western powers will play a role in promoting peace and stability and promoting development and prosperity in other countries, in other regions. This is very important. Having said that, though, General Drew, we see a series of events over the past few years, of course, including this Chilcot report. Uh, one is the referendum inside the UK about Brexit, which, of course, has stirred uh, so much debate, not only before that, but also after it. And now we also see this Chilcot report, which suggested a lack of consultation and scrutiny in the policy making process before going to the war in Iraq inside the UK. So many wonder, are there problems existing with the current state of democracy we're talking about, whether it's UK or the US or elsewhere? Yeah, I think it's a problem. So don't try to believe that, that they practice the democratic systems and their decision making is democratic enough. So. These are two things. They are different things. So I do hope that the, the democratic societies can make democratic policies. This is very important. And right. as also you will have to choose, you will have to respect the choice of other countries. Don't try to enforce your systems and your, your, your will onto the others. So this, I think, should be uh, avoided. In, right. the, in the future. General Zhu Cheng Hu, of course, stay with us. Uh, we are also having you as one of the panelists uh, for our debate uh, about another topic coming up. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we continue today's show with the rim of this led the world's largest multinational maritime military exercise. This year's drill started on June the 30th, launched in 1971. RIMPAC is hosted by the U.S. Navy's Pacific Fleet. China first sent observers to the drill in the year 1998 and participated for the first time in year 2014. This year, China is the drill's third largest contingent. Meanwhile, China opened week-long naval training in the South China Sea on Tuesday, ahead of the Hague's ruling on the apparent Philippines' territorial dispute with China. Before we turn to cooperation and tension on the sea, let's take a look at RIMPAC. The world's biggest naval exercise, the Rim of the Pacific, this year, 26 nations, 45 surface ships, 5 submarines, 200 aircraft and 25,000 personnel are participating in the drill, which started on June 30th. China is participating for the second time, with a larger presence than its first foray in 2014. Among China's fleet are the missile destroyer Xi'an, the missile frigate Hengshui, the supply ship Gao Hu, submarine rescue vessel Changdao, and the hospital ship Peace Ark. As the third largest national contingent in the exercises this year, China has also brought a marine and diving squad. In total, there are 1,200 Chinese officers, soldiers, and sailors participating. During the tactical practice, both Chinese and the U.S. fleets can accurately understand the instructions and rapidly locate at the predetermined spots. It shows that we have been communicating very well and understand the goal of the practice. I congratulate you on a successful exercise. Wa, Juni, Chong, Gong. However, the cooperation in RIMPAC is happening against a backdrop of tensions in the South China Sea. The U.S. has been increasing its military presence in these waters. Two aircraft carriers and their accompanying ships and three destroyers have entered the region. The rhetoric of a few people in the U.S. has become blatantly confrontational. How would you feel if you were Chinese and read in a newspaper or watch on TV reports and the footages about U.S. aircraft carriers, naval ships and fighter jets flexing muscles right at your doorstep and hear senior U.S. military official telling the troops to be ready to fight tonight? On Tuesday, China began week-long military exercises in the South China Sea. The exercises are taking place in the waters around the Xisha Islands, also known as the Paracels Islands. 
Their training activity is the routine arrangement made in accordance with the annual training plan of the Navy. China will firmly maintain its sovereignty in the South China Sea and insist on solving the dispute with relevant countries through direct talk. This drill will finish on July 11th, one day before the arbitration court in The Hague announces its decision on the South China Sea territorial dispute case initiated by the Philippines. But China has made clear that the arbitration result would not be the final word on the disputes in the South China Sea. And for more on the RIMPAC reels, we are joined here in our Beijing studio two panelists. Uh, first of all, Mr. Zhang Junshe, Vice President of China Naval Research Institute, and of course, uh, Mr. Zhu Chenghu, who stay with us for this round as well, Chinese military expert retired from the PLA National Defense University. Welcome to both of you gentlemen. Meanwhile, joining us from Washington, D.C., we're also having two guests. Uh, one is uh, uh, Kurt Volker, former U.S. Ambassador to NATO and now CEO of McCain Institute for International leadership. Also joining us from Washington, Ms. Bonnie Glazer, Senior Advisor for Asia and also Director of the Chinese Power Project with the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, welcome to our program as well. First of all, may I begin by asking you, uh, Mr. Zhang, uh, about what China wants to achieve this time with RIMPAC. Started the end of June, lasting till the very beginning of August. Well, uh, this year, the Chinese Pier Navy have sent five ships uh, to take part in the RIMPAC uh, 2016 exercise. And they will take part in some uh, event, uh, uh, items, including the maritime search and rescue, counter piracy, gunnery operations, uh, and also submarine salvage operations. And most of them fall in the scope of uh, non traditional secure fields. I think through the participation, uh, that uh, the Chinese Navy will promote mutual understanding uh, between China and the United States and also will enhance the cooperation in the future among the navies, including China, Chinese Navy and other navies. Sounds very encouraging, but let's, let's continue a little bit about that. Uh, uh, General Zhu, what do you make of this year? Of course, this year compared to last time, 2014, there was already quite a number of development there. Uh, why China wants to enlarge its participation and why the U.S. is also willing from your perspective? I believe that uh, this sort of uh, uh, exercise will help the uh, military, of, especially the Navy of China, to enrich experience in promoting the cooperation with, other, uh, with the counterparts from mm. other countries, especially from the United States. Second, I believe that uh, this sort of uh, joint training or joint drills will help to increase, I hope, will help to increase trust between the two navies because uh, they are confronting in different different areas, especially in South China Sea and East China Sea sometimes. All so right. I hope this will help to uh, resolve, not necessarily resolve, but to reduce their future tensions and uh, competition or confrontation in this region. Uh, General Zhu, I specifically noticed that, that when you say uh, the possible result, you emphasize on I hope. Yeah. Uh, those two words are extremely important. Uh, Ms. Glazer, what is your hope? Well, I think the China's participant pack is very positive. Uh, there's an increase in uh, the number of activities and exercises that uh, China is joining this year. Of course, they are conducted uh, within the restrictions of the 2000 uh, National Defense Author Authorization Act, uh, which has 12 restrictions on uh, U.S.-Chinese uh, military cooperation. Uh, but this is very positive. I think that uh, these kinds of opportunities for our navies to work together um, enhance to some degree uh, our mutual trust, uh, but more importantly, I think demonstrate the professionalism of our navies uh, and enable the navies to practice uh, f uh, the kinds of skills that, uh, that they are learning separately, not just between the U.S. and China, but really all countries, which we, of course we could put into practice mm. if there is um, some kind of challenge in, for example, uh, natural disasters. Uh, or uh, counter piracy activities. Right. Uh, Ambassador Volker, what do you think? Uh, of course, uh, we all hope there will be uh, some wonderful result, but during the process 
of inviting China to participate. There are different voices certainly coming from Washington, particularly from lawmakers, suggesting this is awarding China for having so-called territorial disputes. What do you think the U.S. can achieve this time, particularly the naval forces? Well, it's, uh, there's always going to be a density of views in Washington. Uh, it's one of the beauties of uh, democracy. Uh, <laughs> that being said, I agree with your first speaker, actually, about the purposes of this. It is to improve the contacts and the connections between the navies, to improve the ability to communicate so that we are able to communicate under any circumstances in this exercise or, or afterwards. Uh, to increase predictability so we understand each other better and how each other will act. And certainly, I am convinced that on the side of neither the United States nor China is there a desire for our armed forces to be in any conflict. We do mm. not want that. I'm sure China doesn't want that. At the same time, we do have differences that put our militaries in close proximity. So having these kind of exercises and contacts and building some cooperation uh, can help d deal with those situations that will arise over time. Right. Th those are all wonderful messages coming out of the uh, two sides. But we have to take notice, uh, uh, Ms. Glazer, the fact that the Hague International Arbitration the ruling of it is likely to come out on July the 12th. That falls into the schedule of schedule time, at least, uh, of the RIMPAC. And within the RIMPAC, there are different military, 26 countries, including China, the Philippines, and the United States. The two countries, China and the Philippines, of course, we know, are the two countries that are in uh, disputed uh, issues of territory. And the U.S. was also sending, has been sending its forces to the South China Sea, which China claims as its territory. So what I've been trying to say is there are critical countries that are involved in this conflict that are present at RIMPAC. What would that mean if the ruling comes out, if tensions being heightened? Well, I certainly don't think it's going to have any impact on RIMPAC. These are exercises that take place uh, every other year. Uh, as I said, very professionally, it's an effort to develop cooperation among uh, militaries, among the, between the navies. Uh, I don't think that the timing of them uh, is in any way going to have an impact uh, on the ruling or vice versa. Mm. Uh, yes, China is exercising now in the South China Sea uh, this week. And of course, prior to that, the United States had two aircraft carrier battle groups that were also exercising in the South China Sea. Um, much of this area is international waters. The fact that the ruling is going to come out on July 12th is, as you say, uh, increasing tensions. But uh, I do agree that uh, there should be no conflict, neither the United States or China wants to have a conflict in mm. the South China Sea or any place else. And so I think that um, we shouldn't get too worked up uh, over the fact that there are military exercises taking place. That's what navies do around the world. They exercise. All right. Uh, General Drew, what do you make of it? Of course, we don't want to be too worked up about anything or speculations, but that's what at least the international focus has been over the past few weeks. So what do you make of it? Can the militaries, despite the possibility of heightened tensions after July the 12th, be able to concentrate on the mission of getting to know one another better, of getting to know and therefore trying to figure out solutions to some of the problems we're facing right now? Can the militaries do that? Uh I believe that the militaries of uh, uh, different countries will have to follow the uh, decisions of the government, mm. uh, especially the political the, leaders. Yeah, yeah, political wills and the political decisions. These are very important. As far as the arbitration concerned, I think uh, it all, all depends on what the Philippines will do. I think the boy is on the uh, court of the Philippines. If the Philippines do not make any provocation, I don't think we Chinese will take any positive uh, react, reactive action against the Philippines. Mm. So this is all, depends on, uh, is all dependent on the 
the actions of the Philippines. So Continue about that argument a little bit. Uh, many say here in China, over the past 100 years, China was forced to hand over some of its territories to Western powers, and now it is adopting a much tougher stand, as some see it, on territorial claims and maintaining peace. For example, earlier, Chinese former state councillor Dai Bingguo called for cooling the temperature in the South China Sea and said China cannot tolerate a war in the region. He also stressed that the South China Sea cannot be another West Asia or North Africa. I guess what he's trying to suggest uh, is that it is not a decision of the country that should be made by the others. Uh, uh, General Volker, of course, there are so many different trades of messages <laughs> coming from all sides at this moment leading up to the July the 12th. China, no tar participation, no acceptance of the ruling. That's the pre precondition. Having said that, though, what would these political environments mean for RIMPAC itself, and particularly for the personnel participating in the RIMPAC and their determination for real and genuine exchanges with one another? Well, uh, as uh, General Zhu and Ms. Glaser said, uh, I, uh, I don't think that the ruling is going to have any impact on the exercises, and the navies are going to take their cues from the political leadership. Mm. And there, the political leadership, I think, has given them clear instructions, run a proper NATO exer uh, naval exercise, work with each other, build those communications. The ruling will be coming down a different track. There will be political reactions to that. I don't believe there'll be any military reaction to that, as your guest said. Um, now, one thing I think is important to bring up, though, is that the fact that there is an arbitration court, the fact that uh, the Philippines and China disagree on territorial claims is important. I'm not suggesting that this ruling will be the final word on all of this and, and there will be no more differences of view. There will be, and there will be more discussion about it. But one of the things that we often hear from China is a very um, unequivocal claim that these islands, these waters are Chinese and that's it. And that is not the way China's neighbors view these okay. territories, these islands, these waters. It is a disputed area. And so hopefully, even while maintaining its position, China can recognize it's a dispute and therefore to try to avoid provocative actions on its part as we hope all parties avoid provocative actions. All right. Uh, Mr. Zhang here in Beijing, first of all, your respond to, uh, response to uh, Ambassador Volker, and secondly, will militaries genuinely do their exchanges? Will these kinds of exchanges through RIMPAC necessarily going to bring the militaries closer with one another and bring the militaries closer to the understanding that the strategic goals of the militaries should be different from going to war with one another, but rather creating peace. Uh, Mr. Zhang, please well, respond, first <coughs> of all, to Ambassador Volker. Well, first, I agree with my uh, U.S. counterparts uh, in that, on that uh, the, the ruling, the award of the arbitration will have no impact on the exercise uh, because uh, the ruling is uh, actually a political a decision, mm. and uh, I, d I don't agree with uh, him on the award, on the the essence of the arbitration. The essence of the arbitration actually is the sovereignty over some maritime features in the South China Sea, which falls beyond the scope of UNCLOS. That means uh, the tribunal uh, has no jurisdiction over this case, and uh, China uh, has uh, sufficient uh, evidence that can prove. China, uh, uh, these, uh, these islands and reefs in the South China Sea belong to China. And, uh, and the exercise will really promote mutual understanding among all the navies because we know that most of the items Chinese Navy is taking part is in the non-traditional field. And this, uh, for instance, piracy is a common enemy for all the countries. So. In the future, I think when they meet with such kind of enemies or threats, they can cooperate more closely. And also, I think the interaction during the exercise between China and the United States will help the navies to reduce misunderstanding and miscalculations when they meet with on the high seas or mm -hmm. even on some occasions you know, when close encounters happen, such as uh, the event when the United States sent its warships uh, to the South China Sea. 
uh, and the Chinese warships follow and monitor the, the U.S. Uh, naval warships there. I, I think see. neither side wants a uh, conflict. All right. We are running out of time for this round of discussion, but certainly I know all of you have a lot to say about the prospect of RIMPAC and also the uh, military exchanges between the two countries and many more. But for now, I have to bid goodbye to all of you. All the best to the RIMPAC, of course. Uh, Jiang Junshe, Zhu Chenghu here in Beijing, Kurt Volker, Bonnie Glazer in Washington, D.C. Really appreciate it for your input and insight. Thank you so much for being with us. Stay with us here on World Inside. We've got our final segment coming right up. Ahead of the Hague ruling on China's territorial dispute with the Philippines, we sit down with Ethan Tauman, a professor of international law, for an in-depth legal perspective. You're watching World Inside coming to you live from Beijing. I'm Tian Wei. The Court of Arbitration in The Hague has said it will deliver a verdict on July the 12th on the South China Sea case unilaterally initiated by the Philippines. China has refused to participate in the proceedings and declared it won't recognize the verdict. A spokesperson for the Chinese Foreign Ministry reiterated that the tribunal has no jurisdiction to judge the case as it is related to territorial sovereignty and maritime demarcation. In January 2013, the Philippines unilaterally initiated an arbitration case on the South China Sea. The Chinese government declared it would neither accept or participate in the arbitration proceedings. China's Foreign Ministry spokesperson Hong Lei said China's position has since been reiterated. In December 2014, the Chinese Foreign Ministry released a position paper on the matter. The paper elaborates China's position over the case. The document also made it clear that the Chinese government's non-acceptance of and non-participation in the arbitration proceedings are solidly founded in international law. The arbitral tribunal in the South China Sea arbitration rendered an award on jurisdiction and admissibility in 2015. The Chinese government immediately stated that the relevant award is null and void and has no binding force. In June this year, China releases a statement on settling disputes between the two countries through bilateral negotiation. Hong Lei also stressed that the Philippines' unilaterally initiation of arbitration breaches international law. He said, through a series of events and the declaration on the conduct of parties in the South China Sea, China and the Philippines have agreed to settle their relevant disputes in the South China Sea through negotiations. The spokesperson also said the essence of the subject matter of the arbitration is the territorial sovereignty over some islands and reefs in the South China Sea, and this is beyond the scope of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS. Hong Lei said China doesn't accept any means of third-party dispute settlement with regard to territorial sovereignty issues and maritime delimitation disputes. He added the Chinese government will continue to abide by the international law and work with states directly concerned to resolve disputes in the South China Sea through talks. And for more on this, we are joined by Professor Stephen Taomeng, who is a director of the Institute for Public International Law at the University of Bonn. Welcome, Professor, to our program. Professor, may I start by asking you, what do you make of the legality of this uh, tribunal to begin with? The tribunal is established under the uh, Law of the Sea Convention, uh, and especially its Annex 7. So all parties to the convention have accepted dispute settlement procedures as foreseen in the convention. So that is the legal basis for the tribunal's work. Mm. However, Professor, as far as I understand, that there are different basis and foundation for different countries to participate as members of this on clause. That, that is right. I think we, we must distinguish your question of the legality or legal basis of the tribunal and the question of the tribunal's jurisdiction. Mm. The question of the tribunal's jurisdiction or its competence to hear certain cases uh, is, a different, is a different question. The tribunal is not a tribunal that can decide all kinds of questions its competence or jurisdiction is limited to disputes concerning the interpretation or application of the Law of the Sea Convention. And within that uh, jurisdiction, 
states have uh, the opportunity or the option to exclude certain disputes, although they are disputes concerning the interpretation or application of the Convention. And China, as you rightly mentioned, has made use of that opportunity and has especially excluded disputes concerning uh, maritime boundary delimitation, law enforcement measures, or military measures. Mm, is China alone in that case? No, of course not. There are uh, quite a number of states uh, which have made such declarations. Mm. This is a normal procedure under the Convention. There is nothing special about this. That has been very clearly explained by you, Professor. But in that case, why would there still be a tribunal dealing with a sovereignty issue? Why would there still be arbitration panel like this? Uh, generally, uh, if one uh, party to the Law of the Sea Convention institutes proceedings, then of course a tribunal must be established. But the first task of the tribunal is to establish its jurisdiction. Under the Law of the Sea Convention, it is the tribunal uh, that has competence to decide on its own competence. This is the competence de la competence rule in international law. Uh, but while investigating its own competence, the tribunal, if it finds that the dispute is about territorial sovereignty, would have had to rule that it has no jurisdiction and to dismiss the case. Mm. Now, of course, as we all know, in October last year, the tribunal assumed jurisdiction with regard to certain of the Philippines' claims, and I and others have argued uh, that the uh, tribunal uh, wrongly did so because these cases or these uh, disputes concerned questions of territorial sovereignty and for that reason were outside the tribunal's competence. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS, is the international agreement that resulted from the Third UN Conference on the Law of the Sea, which took place between 1973 and 1982. The Law of the Sea Convention defines the rights and responsibilities of nations with respect to their use of the world's oceans, establishing guidelines for businesses, the environment and the management of marine natural resources. The convention concluded in 1982 and came into force in 1994. According to figures released by the UN in 2008, the convention is binding for 154 states. Is this going to be an interesting, at least, uh, precedence? And what would that mean for future jurisdiction or possibility of jurisdiction concerning sovereignty? I think you, you chose a, a very interesting term. You said it would be interesting, an interesting precedent. I would call it a very dangerous precedent. Mm. Uh, if tribunals assume jurisdiction over questions uh, over which they have no jurisdiction, uh, this will be very dangerous for all parties to the Law of the Sea Convention. Uh, if tribunals like the present one uh, show some judicial activism, and seize on questions they are not competent to rule on, this may encourage other states to try to use these tribunals also to bring cases that are not subject to the jurisdiction of these tribunals. So you could say it opens the door to the abuse of the Law of the Sea jurisdiction created by the Law of the Sea Convention. What is the danger, if I could follow by using your word, uh, Professor, of making use of international law as a geopolitical and political weapon. Will this be a case that's likely lead us to imagination about similar sort? Yes, of course. If, 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 if the tribunal uh, in its final award would rule on questions of territorial sovereignty, uh, countries like, for example, Argentina could use the same mechanism to bring a case against the United Kingdom to dispute the sovereignty over the Falkland Islands Malvinas that are disputed between the United Kingdom and Argentina. And as we all know, uh, there are many uh, disputes over territorial sovereignty in the various oceans uh, or, or on the globe. So this would just probably be the start of quite a number of cases 
uh, where states would try to use or abuse uh, the dispute settlement mechanisms under the Law of the Sea Convention and use it to further their own aims with regard to territorial sovereignty dispute. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Professor Tao Meng, uh, there has been a lot of different arguments concerning, for example, this territorial disputes between China and the Philippines. Many of those arguments based on the size of one party against the size of the other party, suggesting one is the weaker party while the other is the stronger party. But of course, when it comes to sovereignty, uh, it is not necessarily going to suggest that the weaker party has an upper hand or the stronger party has an upper hand when it comes to international law. So, uh, in, with an international law's perspective, uh, Professor, what do you make of the so-called the stronger party and the so-called weaker party, smaller party and the so-called bigger party? Uh, I think this is just part of the, the overall uh, political dispute. Law is used, as I said, it is instrumentalized and of course a legal dispute is portrayed as a fight between David and Goliath and of course mm. if you do so you, you want to uh, create sympathy uh, for, for, for David. Uh, but that has nothing to do with, with the legal position. Uh, as we all know, uh, the law uh, is generally blind, so it doesn't matter what, 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 what size a country has or, or whether it is more important than another one. Uh, before the law, uh, all parties are, are equal, and, and the law is to be applied objectively to all parties. So I, I would see this more as a part of a strategy in a wider political game uh, to uh, create sympathy for, for one of the parties in the legal dispute, but it has nothing to do with the legal dispute as such. Mm. How much difference, Professor, does it make when it comes to charisma of uh, these uh, panelists uh, sitting on the tribunal? Many suggest the stronger personality they have, they are likely to uh, attract attention in the court and therefore likely to win some uh, votes, uh, quote unquote. Uh, others suggest uh, that is not the case. Uh, from your experience, even though China is not participating in this tribunal, but many around the world are looking at it with a huge amount of attention. What do you make of this element? I think this is, this is a, a very important element. Uh, we should not underestimate the uh, importance of individual judges. We are talking about a panel of five arbitrators. Now these are all very experienced uh, law of the sea judges or law of the sea practitioners or law of the sea academics. But of course each one of them uh, comes with its own, uh, with its own background uh, and its own ideas about international law and the law of the sea. And of course these arbitrators will try to establish their view of the law of the sea as the tribunal's view and in the deliberation mm -hmm. uh, of the uh, five arbitrators there might be stronger characters and weaker characters and the strong characters might want to try to be perhaps more activist uh, they might have a particular view of the South China Sea dispute mm -hmm. they might think they could settle such a dispute and they may take a certain position and try uh, to convince their colleagues that theirs is the right way forward. So I don't think that all five arbitrators are, are really equal in that respect. It's, it's like in any personal relationship. You have uh, people with stronger character, with more charisma, uh, and people with less charisma. And, and the ones who have uh, a stronger personality will prevail at the end of the day. Hmm. Before we go, final, final question for you, Professor. Uh, on July the 12th, a jurisdiction will come out, the ruling will come out. Um, even though we have once again mentioned that China does not accept any ruling from this arbitration because it believes it was illegal to begin with, what do you think should be the advice you would provide both to China and the rest of the world looking at the nature of the ruling of this tribunal and also its possible impact for the international law? Considering the complexity of the disputes in the South China Sea, I think it would be wrong to think that 
the arbitral tribunal can provide the silver bullet to uh, solve the dispute. I think, as we all know, China has not been participating and is not accepting the ruling of the arbitral tribunal. So I think what the states in the region have to do is to look forward. They have to find a common basis uh, to solve their disputes. Now, if, if one important player like China it does not accept uh, the uh, arbitral uh, award, uh, then it doesn't make sense, in my view, of the other parties to seize on that award. And we don't know yet how the award will actually go, which side it will go. Mm -hmm. As you know, uh, there were 15 submissions by the Philippines to the tribunal. In my view, there will be not a clear winner in this case. But of course, independent of the outcome, China has already said it will not participate and it will not accept the ruling. And I think that is, 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 is rightly so, because I agree that there is, there is no jurisdiction, at least with regard to the issues concerning territorial sovereignty. And there are other problems with the award. Mm. So China, even if there are some elements that are favorable to China, uh, will probably not rely on these because it is rejecting the award in its entirety. Now, if China is rejecting it, the award in its entirety, I think it is very important uh, for the other countries in the South China Sea to leave that award behind and to look forward to find, as I said, a new common ground uh, on which to base their negotiations to find a solution to mm -hmm. the dispute. Professor Stephen Chaoman, thank you so much, Professor from the Institute of Public International Law at the University of Bonn. Really appreciate it. We learn a lot. Thank you, Professor. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more of our program, visit our website. Just type in World Insights DCTV News into your search engine. You will be able to find us, or you can also check out our YouTube channel. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone at the World Insight team, thanks for watching. And tune in again tomorrow for more insights from across China and around the world. Good night.